Welcome to our Week of AI by Teacher Goals conference event. And first off, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are out there. Um, thank you for taking time um, away from your families or if you're on the replay, taking time to watch our, our conference and our sessions. Uh, we are super excited to have a whole week of jam-packed awesomeness from thought leaders and educators on AI and education. We have over 24 sessions um, throughout the week. It goes from today all the way till Friday. Our first session today is um, our big keynote by Dan Fitzpatrick. And um, we are going to introduce him in a little bit. But first, Erica, um, I'm, we're your co-host, Amanda Fox. And um, Erica Sandstrom, if you want to tell them a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Erica Sandstrom, and I'm so grateful to be here with this superstar over here. I am known as Green Screen Gal and uh, digital learning coach here north of Boston, and I cannot wait to play with y'all. This is exciting. <laughs> Yay. Um, and I'm just, uh, if, if you guys are watching, if you just drop where you're from and what you do in the chat, we'll be monitoring it. And as always, be sure to hang out after the keynote for Q&A with our presenter. Um, we have... Let's see. Heather's joining us. Hey, Heather. You guys know Heather. He was here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So excited. Here comes uh, Jerry Eason. We've got uh, Dennis uh, Camera, Francis uh, Cottom from um, the UK. I'm pretty sure fans of Dan. Hello, Jerry and Jose. Wonderful. Where are y'all from? Shane. Oh, we got Sheffield in the UK. Nice. You must be tired. <laughs> it's getting late. Right. Oh, oh we got yeah, Brett's here. Nice. Yeah, Brett's here. Um, Angela. Awesome. All right. Um, Erica, do you, do you want to share a little bit about the t-shirt? Yeah, I do. Okay. So if you haven't, I know. Oh, yes. yes. So if you haven't seen uh, this yet from, from all the posting, uh, our, our good friend and uh, fabulous uh, presenter, John Wick, is uh, going to share something with you right now. <laughs> And it's happening. <laughs> okay. Which oh here it is. So sorry about that. Okay, John. Let's get you going. Can you hear that, Amanda? Nope. Nope. Yeah. 
Could you forward slash imagine owning a kick-ass shirt like this one? How about I teach you how to make one? Join my session Monday, May 15th at 6 p.m. And let's journey through the center of AI avatars with Midjourney. You may even win one of these amazing t-shirts. Okay, so as you can see, there's... Um... If you didn't hear that, definitely uh, watch. Um, you'll see that in your booklet. But he uh, created, helps to create these T-shirts. And here you can enter also to win 30 books of AI Classroom and a free hour of PD from your school, a copy of AI Classroom, AI Classroom, sorry, Canva print voucher, and a license to CurePod. There's so much fun um, involved with this T-shirt. Um, or you can just purchase one. So make sure you check that out. Absolutely. And um, again, whenever you buy a t-shirt, um, you're entered in the drawing to win some of these fabulous prizes, which we will be uh, pulling names out on Friday. So stay tuned for that. And if you have not registered yet and you're just tuning in live, we have an awesome um, conference guide for you. So it, um, let me kind of push you to the registration page so you can get the conference guide emailed to you. It has all the bios, sponsor info, some great tools in there. And then after the conference, you're going to get a conference resource pack, with, which has resources and lessons from all of our educators um, that have presented with, with us this week. Um, Erica, do you want to go ahead and bring Dan up? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have the wonderful... Um, did you want me to bring up the, the, the slide hunt or did you want me just to, just to read it off? Just read it off. All right, here we go. Okay. So first of all, I feel like a lot of us are meant to be here. We have an Eric an Erica an Erica and another Eric, <laughs> a Dan and this Dan. So I think we're all kind of meant to be here. All right. This is Dan and Dan Fitzpatrick. He is the author of the AI classroom. Um, and he is, uh, which is the ultimate guide to artificial intelligence and in education. You have to get this book. He was awarded the Tech Champion Award at the Digital Industry Dynamite Awards in 2022 and featured in the latest EdTech 50. Nice. A former member of a secondary school senior leadership team, he is an MA from Durham University at PGCE from UCL and postgraduate diploma in design thinking and innovation from MIT. Yeah, I said MIT. <laughs> so with uh, ready to bring him on. Here and appropriately, go. he's sitting on our MIT panel tomorrow. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hello. Good. Good. Eve. It's evening here. It's ten o'clock in the evening. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having yeah. me. You got your coffee keyed up? Yeah, I had to. I uh, well, I just messaged you before, didn't I, Amanda? I was putting the kids to bed about two hours ago, and then all of a sudden woke up lying on the on the kids' bedroom floor, uh, having <laughs> having fallen asleep. So yeah. Coffee is injected, and I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and um, and queue up your presentation, and we're going to slip down below um, and uh, let you take it away. Again, remember to stick around for Q&A afterwards. Go ahead and drop your questions as you have them in the chat. And once Dan's done with his presentation, I will uh, be sure to – throw your questions into the Q&A um, after, after he's finished. So stick around. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah, let's do this. What an exciting time to, to be in education. There's so much going on at the moment, and, and we're, we're, we're still in those very early days. Uh, but I'm guessing everybody on this call is here because they they know about this technology. They're playing around with this technology. They want to know more, and they want to they want to take it back to their schools, colleges, universities, and and share how revolutionary this technology can be. So hopefully, I can I can do a bit of a dive into this and and show you some some insights um, that I've gathered over the last few years, and um, that can help you in that journey. I've been using this court now for about three years. So it was yeah it was. Yeah, about three years ago, McKinsey and Company published something that said we'll experience more technological progress in the coming decade than we did in the preceding 100 years put together. Now, 100 years put together. Think about it. Last 100 years. Now, I, I'm, I may look like it because it's quite old, but I'm I'm not quite that old um, to, to remember what happened 100 years ago. Uh, it's it's quite late. That's just that's that's why I look this old. Um, but the the amount of progress that has happened over the last 100 years is is astronomical i mean literally we put we put human beings on the moon didn't we 
um, and the amount of of technological progress we've had is the most that the human race has ever been through and yet here we are um saying that in the next 10 and let's say this is three years old next seven years we're going to have more technological progress in the next seven years and the last 100 years put together now that's quite a bold bold statement and i, I i've used this quote because it, it kind of get it it draws attention, doesn't it? It's it, it start of a presentation, something like this, a, a keynote like this. People sit up and go, so there's going to be some change. However, I don't know about you, and if you've played with with ChatGPT or Google Bard or, or some of the, the amazing tools out there, I didn't fully understand this quote until I started using ChatGPT uh, last year. And then when I started playing with it and seeing the responses I was getting – this quote suddenly took on a whole new meaning for me. And I thought, and I could start to see, actually, I see where this is going to go now. I see that, that things are going to massively, massively um, change. And, and we're starting to see that change. We're starting to see that change in industries. Um, how, are we starting to see it in education? Yes, from, those, from the mavericks, from, from the people who, who lead the way. Um, mainly from the ground up. Let's be honest at this point, uh, but also let's be honest. Education isn't isn't always the first sector to 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 innovate, unfortunately. Um, but I don't think we can hide away from this much longer. And we're gonna have to get. We're gonna have to start innovating with education. I'm gonna dive in right at the deep end here. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna kind of. Uh, I'll leave some of the cool stuff uh, just for a few minutes' time, but I want to put the, this whole conversation into a context. Um, the three box solution for innovation. Uh, it's a it's a great strategy. If you've never heard of it, um, I suggest you get you get the book. Just do a search into Amazon three box solution to innovation, um, and it says that every business, okay, and I'm and I'm and I'm putting education in there with that. Every business should look at their operations in three boxes. And I'm going to take you through it. So box one is the current performance engine. So for a business, it's what they're doing to be successful right now. So they are, they're producing a product, they're producing a service, they're making, some, they're making their money. And it's something they've worked on for a few years. Education, it's, it's what you're doing right now. So if you're a teacher, it's, it's how your school is running right now. It's the culture. It's, it's when you get up every morning and go into work. It's what you're doing in order to be successful within your school, college, university. Now, I'm going to skip to box three, because in the three-box solution to innovation, it says that we need to commit some resources to, to, to box three. And essentially, box three is somewhere where we need to go to listen for the weak signals of what could disrupt us. Okay? Now... Sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, we we try to optimize box one. Whatever we're doing, the current the current working system we have, we optimize it, don't we? So we we try to make things more efficient, and and and, and rightfully so. Teachers have got a lot on their plate. They they do so much work, and trying to optimize that is, I mean, it's survival. If that's to be honest, for some teachers, uh, for a lot of teachers, because there's just so much to do. But sometimes we think that optimizing box one is innovation now this model says it's not it's just optimizing the current way of doing things now i'm going to show you today some of the ways that ai this new brand new ai is optimizing the current way of doing things it's box one okay and there's nothing wrong with that at all because we need to optimize that system and and i'm saying every day i get to speak to educators all over the world and I get to see jaws hit the floor. Now, if you've, if you've trained any um, any teachers, any educators on this technology, you have that amazing moment where you see, you literally see the, the joy on people's faces when they realize that this technology is going to save them hours and hours worth of time. That, that day on a weekend that you dedicate to work for free, those evenings can now be condensed because of this technology. And we rightfully need it. We need to optimize that current system. However... This technology, I believe, and I don't think I'm wrong in believing this because all the hallmarks of, of what's coming down the line are, 
are, are, are quite obvious and, and a lot of them not not so obvious as well because of the disruption that's going to come. We're going to have to spend more time in box three thinking about how this technology is going to truly disrupt education. Okay, Not just optimize it, but change it, and it will change it. Now, whether it changes it next year or it changes it in five years because, because the education system is slow to get with it, it, it will have to change it because it's going to transform learning. It's going to transform how people work, how people live. In the next few months, the next few years, we're going to see that massively. We're going to see that. Right, let's, should we jump into, um, into what, what this chat GPT is? So if you're not, I, I was using it for about a week, you know, before I even started, before I asked myself the question, what, what even is this that, that I'm using? Um, and I don't know if you've thought about it or you've, or you've done any research on it, but um, ChatGPT is, is the one I first started using. I know Google Bard, so Google did an announcement the other day. Google Bard is now completely free for everybody to use, so you can go and sign up and, and get an account for that. Um, but ChatGPT 3.5, if you've got a free free ChatGPT account, that will be the one you're using. Now, if you pay for it, you get GPT-4, which is a bit more advanced. But GPT-3.5 was trained on 300 billion words okay so it's an ai system trained on 300 billion words now just to try and because those th those numbers are just they're, they're too big for us to to grab to grapple with so if you, on average we read about uh, 100 words every 30 seconds so if you're reading a book 100 words every 30 seconds it would take 2854 years to read that many words that's how much information the old version of chat GPT is trained on. Okay. And uh, the newer version, GPT four is trained on, they think, because we don't we don't fully know because they haven't released this information, but we think it's about two and a half the size of of GPT three. So reading a hundred words every 30 seconds with GPT four would take around seven thousand years. That's how much information it's trained on. Now to put that in context, seven thousand years ago started to get uh, agriculture the invention of the wheel, the first languages we start to see cropping up. So we're talking about vast amount of data here. And because they are trained to simulate human conversation and to and it's generative AI, so uh, it generates content, generates data, um, because of that, it, it, it has a huge knowledge base. And if you've played around with it, uh, you'll see just how much information it has at its disposal and how much it can and how effectively it can transmit that information in a, in a human-like way, using human um, language, almost like you were talking to a human being. Now, when, you, when I talk about things like ChatGPT and Google Bard, it's text-to-text, -text, isn't it? So you, you write something, you input with text, and you output with text. We are seeing so many other types of generative ai now so this i mean this image here I've, I've been using it for about six weeks in my presentations and it's an old image now there's thousands and thousands of companies popping up every week at the moment offering new um, um innovative solutions so look at the top there text to image so a lot of the images i'm using in this presentation and a lot of the images that are in the ai classroom book are, are generated by um mid journey a really, really powerful text to image. You type in the type of image you want, and it gives you that unique image. Text to video. Now we're starting to see that in the last few, in the last few weeks, really taken off. People just writing in to a, a video generator what type of re, what type of photo realistic video they want, and it's coming coming out with it. I just just this evening before I I came on this this webinar. Um, I, I saw a post where Coca-Cola, their new advert, is is generated by Stable Diffusion, uh, which is an, which is an image generator. They've, they've, there's a bit of manual editing in there, but uh, the vast majority of it is created by Stable Diffusion, and it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal if you if you go check that out. Text to audio, text to text, like I've already mentioned, text to motion, text to code, text to NFT, text to 3D, audio to text, audio to audio brain to text we're getting into, we're getting into sci-fi territory here and image to text i think it comes down to this okay so this is something i put in i put in the book and it in the ai revolution which is what what we've entered now i think 
we will create new realities simply using words. Okay. So whether that be through audio, text, we're going to, we've got the ability now to become world-class artists. Now, uh, that's no exaggeration. We're seeing AI-generated art winning art competitions, global art competitions. We, we are seeing people create um, music, hit music. In fact, there's, there's been a big, there's been a big, conversation in the last few weeks because it a bit of music had to be pulled down from spotify because it was ai generated and it was using um simulated voices of, of existing artists and and it was pulled down for copyright reasons and rightfully so but the technology is there to replicate these things to create new realities and remember chat gpt released late november what's that six months ago we're still in the early days of this. We're starting to see these use cases come out. Where it's going to go in the coming months and years is is going to be, we're not even going to be to imagine it. I, I sometimes compare it to, if you think of 1997, right? If you're old enough and you're on this call, 1997, I think I was, I was 11 years old in 1997. And I remember we got, my parents got, a, got the, our first ever computer. And it was a, it was this big thing that sat on a desk in the, in fact, it was in the corner of the dining room. And I remember, I think they, they got it where they were paying monthly on this computer. And after two months, they sent it back because they, they came to the conclusion that why, why would we use it? We don't, we don't really have any use for it, for this computer thing. Um, but look, think of what it was like 1997, no Google yet. Uh, basic browser capabilities, not many websites on there. Um, basic email. Fast forward 10 years, 1997, 2007. What major event happened in 2007 that changed the, the tech industry forever? Steve Jobs stood on a stage and introduced the iPhone for the first time. Now, who could have known that from 1997 to 2007, the advancements of mobile cloud technology would have gone so far that we would have reached that in just 10 years. Things are going to happen in the coming weeks, months, and years that we have no idea about yet. We, we can guess some of it because it's we, we can see where this technology kind of naturally leads and we just need people to do it, and that takes a while. But some of the use cases, some of how this technology is going to turn out, we can't even imagine it yet. So if we're able to create global um, professional art, music, videos right now with this technology six months in, where are we going to be this time next year? Now, I, I mentioned some of the sci-fi examples. This is another one. If you, if you go to Google and you search uh, Japan University brain scans, and image generation, you will find a report that was uh, an academic report that was published about two months ago where they got some participants, they give them an, a, a, an option uh, from, a, from a, an image bank of images to choose. They chose an image and they thought about that image and then they put them in an MRI scanner and then they used the scans from that MRI scanner and used stable diffusion and image generator to recreate the image that that person was thinking of. And here is are the actual recreations. So the images along the top are the images that the participants were, were actually thinking of, and the images below were what the, the image generator recreated from the brain scans. Now, it's not, I mean, it's obviously not 100% accurate, but it's, it's pretty, pretty close, isn't it? So we're... If we're already delving into sci-fi territory, <laughs> I can't stress this enough. And if you come away with one thing from this from this half hour, it will probably be that Dan said, uh, "Where are we going to be next year?" Quite a few times. I'm, yeah, because I think I think that's the fascinating question. I think that's the fascinating question. Where are we going to be? Um, other examples: ChatGPT four saved my dog's life. So I'll sum this. I'll summarize, paraphrase this really quickly for you. Um, guys, dog is sick. He takes it to the vet. The vet does some blood tests, says he's going to be okay. 
the guy goes home with the blood test results, puts them into ChatGPT4. ChatGPT4 says, actually, your dog could have this disease. He takes the the results from ChatGPT4 and the dog to another vet, and the vet intervenes and saves the dog's life. The dog literally would have died. So we're starting to see. Now, now it would be ris- remiss of me not to say you got to be careful with this technology. You can't just rely on it to save your life or, or to give you to give you vital information. There's 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 a lot of errors with this technology, which I'm sure will will advance and, and has already advanced over the last coming coming month, uh, last few months. But we're starting to see starting to see use cases coming out of this technology that that saving lives. Uh, on a more lighthearted note, do we? Some of you might have seen this. So we had uh, the Pope walking around Rome in a, in a big white puffer jacket. Um, I think in the UK we'd call that a puffer jacket. I'm not sure about the United States or wherever else you are. I've just noticed somebody's from is in Ethiopia. That's amazing. Um, great, to, great to see so many people tuning in from all over the world. Uh, this this image was completely false. It was it was an it was an, an image generated by Mid Journey, but the photorealism of these generations are so advanced that they look like true images and actually you, you don't really get this you don't really get how good they are from this image but the original images were like 4k that's how that's how um high quality these images are uh, another version which you might have noticed uh, especially those in the united states when a few weeks ago when it was announced that trump could be arrested um, these images surfaced online, uh, caused a bit of anger among some people because they thought they were real images completely generated by by Mid Journey. Let me show you another example, and I think I've turned the sound on, so you should hear this. Uh, this is this is voice generation, and I'm just going to let it speak for itself, really. So let me play it, and then. Right, hopefully you can you can hear this. If you can't hear it, can somebody let me know and I'll just I'll stop and move on. <laughs> and with this microphone, you'll hear a live version of Holly Plus developed with Vokter Labs. So he's got two microphones. He's got one microphone with his real voice. And he's got another microphone that's plugged into an AI voice simulator of a female voice that you just heard there. Now watch what he does with this. Take it away, Fer. It gets so murky Loving what you know But I... I keep on swimming, I'm swimming further up the road. See, the problem is, I don't know what to say when you come around acting this way. And yes, the truth is, I show you every day Cause you love to stay Living in all the pain And it gets so murky Loving what you know But I keep on swimming further up the road and i've been calling out calling out your name deep down in my sleep and i even memorize so you can see there just how much this this technology isn't just about text to text even isn't even just about images but the 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 ability for it to recreate voices there is absolutely phenomenal. Now, I just want to show you an example. Let's bring it back around to education. So I was working a couple of months ago. I was working with some history teachers uh, here in the UK, and I I wanted to show them how easy it was to recreate uh, the animation, essentially, and how they could do it really, really quickly. Now, um, Amanda mentioned it earlier with the, the T-shirts, 
how how they've created the these animations of the speakers for this for this uh, week of AI, uh, similar technology, and I just want to show you how it can be applied to education. So this I I was able to recreate this in ten minutes using four different AI tools. Okay, so I was I used ChatGPT to get the 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 script. So I I trained it to be Henry the Eighth, the King Henry the Eighth, um, and I asked it a question. But if you're into history, uh, English history, then uh, a cardinal called Cardinal Wolsey um, fell out of favour with Henry VIII because he because he didn't get his marriage annulled from the Pope. Um, so he talks about Wolsey. Um, I was able to recreate an image of Henry VIII using Mid Journey. I was able to take the script and get an AI voice, like an, an English voice, to to create the the voice, the audio. Then using a, a tool called DID, I was able to take the audio file, the the image of Henry VIII, and it merges them together and creates an animation. Less than 10 minutes. I'm not an animator. I'm, I, I don't have any special skills here, and I spoke to teachers who've done it in less than 10 minutes now, essentially logging in to, to these tools and pressing some, some buttons, essentially. A bit of imagination is all it takes. So this is the video that, I was able to create. Wolsey, that Cardinal of York, was a trusted advisor and servant to me for many years. He served as Lord Chancellor and was instrumental in the administration of my kingdom. However, his failure to secure the annulment of my marriage to Catherine of Aragon was the beginning of his downfall. Additionally, his accumulation of wealth and power was seen as a threat to my own authority. For these reasons and others, I was forced to dismiss him from his positions of power. A lot when I show that, a lot of people ask, "Did I use an image of myself to create that?" I didn't. Okay, <laughs> um, although I do, I do recognise the similarity there. Um, so the that was two months ago, right? Two months ago, I went back uh, last week. I used exactly the same tools, exactly the same prompts. So prompts being what I'm asking the the AI to do for me. And this is what it came up with. So in two months, this is how much this technology has advanced. Wolsey's primary duty was to serve me, his king, and yet he did not accomplish what I demanded of him. As thou mayest know, I did seek to annul my marriage to Catherine of Aragon, for she did not bear me a male heir to secure the Tudor dynasty. I sought the Pope's permission to end the Union, and Wolsey, being the Lord Chancellor and Cardinal, was tasked with persuading His Holiness to grant me this boon. Alas, Wolsey did not succeed in this most crucial mission, much to my disappointment and ire. The Pope refused to annul the marriage, and I was left with no choice but to take matters into mine own hands. This failure of Wolsey's did greatly diminish his influence and standing in my court. Moreover, Wolsey's own ambition and wealth did breed resentment and jealousy amongst my nobles, who conspired against him and sought to undermine his position. They So you can see there just how much this is. Now, this was made on a version of Mid Journey 5.1, which was just released a few days ago. And you can you we're getting a photo like a photorealistic image animation there of Henry VIII. Essentially, in under 10 minutes, any teacher who plays around with this technology can create studio production quality resources in under 10 minutes. I think of the engagement there. In this tool, DID is now bringing out the capability for for having actual real-time conversations as well with, with, with animated characters like this. And when you have something like ChatGPT in there as well, ChatGPT is able, if you ask it, to 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 talk from the point of view of a historical or literary figure. Now, I've used it with Romeo from Union and Juliet. Um, just think of the engagement for your students here, and the the possibility for them to learn almost firsthand from these characters. Now that we know they're not real, we know that. But if you ask ChatGPT to take on the persona and the knowledge base of these these characters. Uh, the insight it gives them, and not just for knowledge, for empathy, to be able to understand. So I, I did one, and I, I'm aware that a lot of my examples here are very English, but this, that's where I live. But I did one with uh, uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill, and he, and 
and able to to kind of understand some of the decisions he made because he he was expressing why he made those decisions, able to ask him if he was scared during the World War Two. So the ability to 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 get students to think empathetically and critically critically think of these scenarios from the points of view of these characters is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And the engagement rate there, uh, the potential there is, is absolutely huge. Um, still still going through some examples. This was literally just released three days ago uh, by Google. It's called Music LM. Um, you can go on, you join a waiting list, but I think I joined the waiting list and I think I got access within about 12 hours. So um, you'll get in there very quickly. And you can essentially um, go in and let, actually let me see if I can get in there and and, um, and show you this because I think I think the power is in actually showing what this what this actually looks like. Um, let me see if I can do it. So it's a really bad idea trying to do this off the hoof uh, during a live presentation, but let's give it a go. See if I can do it. You can't see anything at the moment because I've got it on another tab, but I'll jump to the tab in just a sec once I've signed in. Yes, I'm in. Right. So here I am. I'm in Music LM. And all I do essentially here, see if I can zoom in a bit, I type in the type of music I want, and it's going to create in about 10 seconds a unique piece of music. Okay. So I might type in... Um, soundtrack for an ai conference let's say, uh, let's say upbeat let's include some electric guitar as well okay, here create a unique bit of music based on my problem <laughs> Gives me two tracks as well, so we'll have a listen to the second one. Let's try something else. Um, so it gives you gives you some uh, suggestions as well. Two nylon string guitars playing in flamenco style. Let's click that one and see what it, so. It's going to generate this. This is unique as well. All right. So if I, if you were to put your prompt in, same prompt, I put mine in, it's going to come up with two different bits of music. So let's see what it comes up. Two nylon string guitars played in flamenco style. <laughs> you can do is you can download that and use it so amazing and we start i think someone's just put in uh, someone on facebook has just has just written loving the beginnings of ai music it's yeah i, I, I like what you how you phrase it because it is the beginning like look how powerful it is and it's the beginning where is this going to go disruption of the music industry 100 percent. that's going to happen major disruption just like every other industry um from tools like this and people with with i talked before about how the the kind of how this technology allows people to become um amazing artists amazing composers for example um a lot of people a lot of people get afraid when when i say things like that and, and rightfully so to a certain extent because a lot of people in our society are highly trained people train for, for years to be to be superb musicians, to be amazing artists. They go to college, university, and so on to do this. But what about them? Are they just going to lose their job? Oh, I'm hopeful. I don't think that's the case. I see this floor rising, okay? So someone like me, who's just not very artistic, now gets to create really good art. Now gets to create some, some cool music, okay? It democratizes, to a certain extent, creativity, Okay, but I think those who are skilled, those who have the know-how that I don't have and the skills, can do in so much more with these tools than I can. And I'll give you just a short example before I move on. 
uh, a friend of a friend is a tattoo artist. And she normally works, her workflow is, is something like this. So on a Monday, she meets with a client. They, they go through the art. He gives his ideas. She gives her ideas. She then presents them with the first draft, and they iterate throughout the week. Hopefully by the end of the week, they've, he's agreed or she's agreed on the type of tattoo they want. They've signed off the art. Then the week later, she begins the process of doing the, the actual tattoo. Now she's able to sign off on the art within 24 hours using these tools because of her her know-how, her knowledge, her ability to prompt these tools with specific um, key terms and language that I just couldn't be able to do. She's able to get so much more out of these tools. It has actually increased her workflow and increased her business. Just one example there, but and and I'm no utopian neither. We're going to see a lot of jobs go. We're seeing that at the moment. We're seeing some companies, instead of hiring new employees, are just holding out because they know that the AI is going to be able to do it. So we're going to see massive disruption within, within uh, labor markets. But that always happens with new technology. So many more jobs are going to be created as well. So disruption, although it's positive, can also have some negatives in terms of society. Now, what does this mean for teachers? I think I think what it means is things are going to change vastly in the next few years, next few months, let's say, even. Now, I think a lot of the examples that you're seeing are going to help, um, are going to be in box one. They're going to help teachers be more efficient. Uh, but they need to learn how to do this stuff. And, I, and I've put it on this chart here. Uh, it's just a basic chart, really. I included it in the book, The AI Classroom. And it's essentially saying that if you look at the, um, I always get mixed up between the X and Y axes. So really sorry if there's any maths teachers out there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what they are. <laughs> uh, the, let's say the one on the left, the one going up uh, is, is the quality of pedagogy. I think that's still needed, just like how I'm talking about how the artist still needs the artist's skill with these tools. The teacher still needs the the, the pedagogy, okay? Um I know some people pronounce it pedagogy, especially in, especially if you're in the states. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say pedagogy. Uh, they still need those skills, and 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 rightfully so. The teacher is the expert when it comes to pedagogy. When it comes to learning design, I mean, you'd think that's the bread and butter of any teacher. That's still very much needed. But then also the quality of prompt craft. And there's a whole chapter in the AI classroom on prompt prompt craft and how to how to do that well. Promcraft is essentially how do you prompt this technology to get the best from it? And and we want to be in that top right hand corner where the quality of pedagogy and the quality of promcraft is is at a level where teachers can work with AI to get the best results, can save hours of time, and learning is improved as well. Right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna run you through some examples here. Uh, in this example here, let me just pause it. So I'm essentially asking ChatGPT to create some questions for me. Very basic. So using the teacher method of retrieval practice, and hopefully you can see there, retrieval practice is a, is a pedagogical method. Okay, so the teacher is put, is putting into the prompt as well as being able to prompt the pedagogy. So we're seeing pedagogy and prompt craft coming together here. So using the teacher method of retrieval practice, plan out questions for a GCSE UK class. This is a, a, a very English specific example on photosynthesis over a five day period and so on. Then we'll, we'll see the results here in a second using Bloom's taxonomy. So again, we're getting pedagogy in there. And you can see there, day one, it's ask, it's doing what I've asked it to do. It's it's coming out with those questions. Okay, just a very basic examples. And some of you who have used ChatGPT will be using it in this way. Let me go to another example here. So in this example, I'm going to get it to mark an exam question, a student's answer to an exam question. And you will see that I've put in, what would you grade this answer and why? I've given it the question, the, the exam question. I've given it the student's answer. And I've given it the rubric or the mark scheme underneath. A lot of people ask, how do you get the student answer as, as text? Because I know over here in the UK, a lot, of, a lot of exams are still done with pen and paper. I use a tool called Google Lens, which is on my phone where he can scan it, it detects the text, and you can copy and paste it out. 
Now we'll go within seconds. It's telling you what it would grade the answer based on the rubric and then given the reasons why it is given those answers. And you can do this. You can go over to ChatGPT, Google Bard, create an account, and you can do this right now. Uh, this one, a bit more ambitious, I'm going to get it to create a full lesson, a full lesson's worth of, of materials. Uh, granted, this is quite a traditional lesson. Some of you might not teach like this. Um, but just to, to show you how this can be done. So you can see here, asked it for three paragraphs about the demographic transition model. It's a, it's a geography class. Uh, include multiple choice questions at the end of each paragraph. Uh, they're also known as pinge questions to, to assess whether students have understood those paragraphs. Create subject-specific words, activities, base them on solo taxonomy. Uh, create a group task and a stretch question at the end there. So very much embedding the pedagogy of how how um, a teacher might teach and the, the prompt craft there as well. And you can see it's creating those paragraphs and the questions. And it'd just be a case of simply copying that out, putting it into your resources, however, and using it however you teach. So we're on to the third hinge question there. And then we've got the subject specific words with the basic definitions. Now you can use in the prep method, uh, which is a method that's spreading right around the world at the moment. The, the amount of teachers from different countries around the world who tell me they use in prep, you can really, really hone in on the speci specificity of, of your question because the quality of the input, the question or the prompt determines the quality of the output with AI. So prep, uh, if, you, if, if you're not familiar with it, essentially stands for prompt. So this is how you structure your request. So you tell it what you want. To, what you, want. you give it a role. So if, you, if, you, if you're getting it to do some geography content, get it to be a geography teacher, and it takes on that persona and uses the knowledge uh, of, of that type of persona. So we've got prompt, role. We've got E, explicit instructions. So you want to give it as men much instructions as possible because it can't read your mind. And the the less you leave out of your prompt, the more ChatGPT or Google Bard fills in for you. So, for example, if you don't set the tone, if you don't give it a tone, if you don't give it a reading age level, it's just going to choose one for you. And you want to be in control. Remember, the teacher is the practitioner, the skilled practitioner here. You want to be in full control of this. Okay, let, let the AI do the doing you still do the thinking. And I've got another example here. So a bit of admin uh, over in the UK, it's very popular to write curriculum states of intent at the moment. So we essentially a document that explains why you're teaching what you're teaching in a certain course uh, so that parents and, and governors and so on can, can read that on, the, on a school website. Uh, can take a while to do, especially when you're trying to justify what you're teaching. And essentially just just prompted ChatGPT to create this for me and then put some of the, the topics that we're covering in the course. Click Submit, and it's going to create that nice document for me that I can then use on a on a school website or wherever I want to use. And it's, it's going to write that. I... I, just to address this fear, because I think when a lot of people, when they're first getting into this, one of the biggest fears they have is that it's going to take over literacy, and because students are just going to go, well, I'll just pop it into chat GPT, and I'll get my results. I'll get my essay. I'll get my whatever I'm doing. And I think it's a false dichotomy to, to, to play literacy versus off against AI to red heron because they're both intimately connected and hopefully you can see from those examples and some of the some of the showcasing I've done in this talk that you need to be really literate to get the best out of these tools and in fact there was a study that came out of the US a few weeks ago that said that the people who are most educated are getting the most out of AI at the moment and it's down to literacy skills but I think I think there's hope there because what a context to teach literacy to our students if we teach them in the context of you're going to be able to, to to get really amazing results out of artificial intelligence, 
I imagine the students who are going to want to learn how to how to improve their writing skills, their grammar skills, their spelling, and so on and so on, um, and how they how to express themselves through language. Uh, I think there's real opportunities here. We need to collaborate with it. Um, you'll find this in the book as well in the AI classroom. In fact, there's a full chapter on how how teachers can collaborate with AI and use it as a as as that tool that's gonna that's gonna bring these benefits. Uh, another reason here's a, here's a chart that I I, I created uh, me and ChatGPT and me versus just me. So you can see there the orange line ChatGPT within thirty minutes does a task that takes me a lot longer. In fact, about three hours worth. When I've represented this, I always say that ChatGPT and me sounds like. It sounds like a, the title of a cheesy movie, but uh, <laughs> there we go. So hopefully you're getting the point there, the, the amount of time that it can save. And we're, we're in box one here. I know we're in box one um, and we're, we're, we're just, we're helping teachers be more efficient, but I think it's so important, especially at this moment. We've got over in the UK, we've got teachers going out on strike, um, worse pay of teachers in a long time. So, to, to help to these, the fact that these tools can help is a massive massive advantage back into box three for a second if you don't mind i love i love being in box three because that's where my imagination runs wild uh sam altman who created chat gpt is the, he's the ceo of, of open ai said that chat gpt is a horrible product now <laughs> it's probably one of the most revolutionary bits of technology that's ever been created and he describes it as a horrible product why because he can see what's coming he knows what's coming in the next in the next uh, few years. Um, I've just noticed Amanda and Erica jump back in. I think that's my signal. But uh, give me give me one more minute and I'll and I'll close this off. Uh, Greg Brockman said in February that a year from now we'll look back fondly on on the AI that I've just shown you is quaint and antiquated. What is going to come? Um, what's the role of humans here? Chess is over said by Gary Kasparov in 1997 when Deep Blue beat him. Um, the 1997, in the 90s, AI beat the, the the most skilled chess player in the world, and he famously said chess is over. It's not over. In fact, I I, I don't know anything about chess, by the way, but from what I hear, it's, it's never been more popular. It's never been more popular. Why? Why? Because... I think there's something about the human, the human journey within this, the human struggle, the the human story that that we'll not, we don't want to get rid of. It would be technically, technically, it would be even, it would be better to watch two AI play chess against each other. But we choose to watch humans because, I, and I think hopefully it alleviates some fear that we're not going to live in some kind of matrix world where AI puts us all into comas and and. And the AI runs the world. The, the humanity is still very much got a place in this. And and when I was I was doing some research for the book, I interviewed a good friend of mine called David Price, who writes about the future of work. And he came out with this phrase. He said, "The nature of the dance between humans and machines." And I think it's such a profound way to to explain where we're at at the moment. And um, we've started this dance. We don't know where to put our feet. We don't know we don't know where to move. But we've started it, and we need to figure that out. One thing is for sure, though, that within any dance, and I don't dance, by the way, but I've watched enough uh, Dancing with the Stars or or Strictly Come Dancing, as we call it in the UK, to know that there has to be a leader. Someone has to lead the dance, and, and it needs to be the humans. We need to stay in control of that. Uh, Wayne Gretzky famously said, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And I think that is the key message that the education system needs to take from this new technology we need to have our eyes on the horizon so hopefully I, i've kind of give you like a bit of an overview of where we're at where it's going but also some of the practical implications for right now for the classroom um so thank you and i'll i'll wrap up there all right so thank you dan um if you have any questions for him be sure to drop them in the chat um really quickly i just want to thank our sponsors um we have eduade AI, which is a, a great um, uh, platform for educators to use to reduce workflow and generate lesson plans. We have Schemely, which is a course creator, Conquer, um, which is a tool developed by Moat. 
We have Canva, which just recently added DID. They integrated DID into Canva. So um, the Henry VIII that Dan showed earlier, you can definitely um, go into Canva. Canva is student facing. Students have access to that. So it's, it's a wonderful um, convergence of two tools um, leveraging AI. And then last but not least, Curapod. Curapod is, is kind of like Nearpod with uh, AI magic integrations that generate uh, and also assess student work. So um, I'm just going to remove that. So if you have any questions for Dan, feel free to drop them in the chat. And a reminder that at six o'clock, we have Brett Salakas coming on and he's going to talk about AI invaded my classroom. So um, Cheryl says, hello, this is awesome. Hi, Cheryl. Um, Nicholas um, from Brazil, he says good night. <laughs> uh, Fazia from Canada. I hope I hope I didn't put him to sleep there. No, that's no. not what he's at. <laughs> and that was amazing. My mind is blown. I see why you were a keynote. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, and no, then... it's class. And I think probably just to say those those two of the sponsors. Um, I know you. I know you guys. When it comes to stuff like this, you go work with people or companies or tools that are actually having an impact, and all of those are phenomenal tools if you don't if you want to kind of if you want to maybe steer away from chat gpt which i dive into it because it's easy to use i know i talk about the prep method but just ask it a question and start playing with it but if you want to go to like a, a good user experience of, of some 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 amazing tools uh the ones that you just mentioned there are, are, are absolutely fantastic and make sure you check out dan's list of tools at aieducator.tools um, there's a he's started a fantastic repository, a lot of which are pulled from the book and then more. It's growing every day. He's so adding um, adding new tools as they come out. So it's pretty reflective of uh, current like brand new things like the music tool that you just showcased. Yeah, yeah. Have a look at it. Uh, yeah. The the what's what was it? AI educator tools. That's the website. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got some cool, there's some really cool tools on there, and and you can search for it for them whether they're paid, freemium, uh, free, whether what the different um, what the different uh, functions are as well. So if you're looking for some tools to start playing with, it's it's a great place. If I say so myself. I don't um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got a little lost in that list, so <laughs> I will not be sleeping tonight. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dan. <laughs> uh, we got a question. Tricia says, um, Dan that. mentioned a copyright issue with an AI piece of music using artist voices. What about AI art then? Yeah, mm -hmm. a, a really good question. And uh, this question always comes up um, and it's a really genuine, it's a, it's a genuine question. So I know, I know what you, what you, what you're thinking here uh there's a few approaches to this so some of the newer tools like if you look at adobe some of the image creation that tools that they're creating they're actually using um uh, a bank of of uh stock images that they've that they've purchased access to and um, to to alleviate this issue however uh there is a court case actually in the united states at the moment uh, against mid-journey and stable diffusion from a stock image company and a lot of people think this is going to clear a lot of it up because, and I, I, I'll try not to get too technical, but essentially it comes down to, um, is is this transformation of the art or is it copying of the art? Now I could I could get an easel out and and some paint and and try and replicate Van Gogh's Van Gogh swirls, and it, I wouldn't be breaking copyright there uh, because I've I've it's my own interpretation. So there's there's a big there's a big. Uh, there's a big debate to be had, but the way, I, by the way, stop me if you need to, because I could talk forever on this. Yeah, we got uh, about one minute. I, I, I think, think about Napster in the late 90s. Anyone who used Napster, um, oh, yeah. Napster rightfully got shut down because of the copyright it was breaking. Okay. Um, but the, 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 the kind of core principles of, of how we consume media that, that yeah. were discovered in Napster, we live with today in things like Spotify, Apple Music, podcasts, uh, Netflix. So whatever whatever tools we're going to see in the next few years, we're going to see them refined. Plus also, I, I saw an interview this morning with a guy who, who created Stable Diffusion, which is, which is an English company. Uh, and he said, actually, if a robot was walking down the street and was seeing art through its eyes and then recreating it, we'd all think about this differently. So what's the difference between it seeing this art on the internet? It's, exactly. quite a, 
it's quite a profound question, I think. And I think I think this is symptomatic of the area we're now going in. We're going to have to have a lot of these conversations and, because the old systems don't work anymore. And with with that conversation and on that note, if you join our MIT panel tomorrow at 430, we're going to delve into that. Children's rights, copyright issues, ethics and bias. So mm. make sure you tune in tomorrow at 430. Thank you, Dan, for joining us. Um, we've got to bounce to our next keynote. Um, feel free to connect with him um, at the AIeducator.io. Drop him a line, and he's also on Twitter. So, yep, um, yep at get, Dan Fitzpatrick. Get in contact if you want more prompts. I've just put I've just put something on Twitter and LinkedIn today, which is, has loads of prompts in, uh, which is absolutely free. So go on and, and get it, and yeah, interact with me. Um, I'm going to be in the states in July as well, which I'm quite excited about. So. Um, if you want to meet, let me know. Um, let's see yep. if we can work something Florida, out. Florida, hopefully California. So also um, July 13th through 19th, if you're looking to book Dan for PD, please reach out to him. He is stateside. And that's uh, going to be the only time this year, maybe. But we know we've got that chunk of time to so definitely reach out and schedule some PD. Yeah. Um, have a wonderful okay, yeah. uh, rest of your evening. and. Yeah, well, it's bedtime now. It's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to go to bed. Uh, I'll <laughs> catch up with Brett's talk tomorrow when I wake up. Brett, good awesome. luck. Hope it goes well. Uh, and I'll see you tomorrow for the MIT panel at uh, yep. half 4:30. four EST. Yep. And awesome. those of you who are t planning on tuning in with Brett, obviously we're starting one minute late. If you stay on the social media channel you are currently in, the new stream will automatically start. You can also follow. go to YouTube teacher go at teacher goals and um, automatically pick up the live there as well. All right. Ah.